Good morning. I'm David Wessel. I'm director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy here at Brookings. Our mission is to uh, improve the quality of fiscal and monetary policy and public understanding of it. Uh, we'll, hopefully we will not be judged by performance, but um, it seemed to us that one of the most vexing questions uh, that comes up with monetary policy is, did the Fed's very aggressive asset buying, the bond purchases known as quantitative easing, contribute substantially to the increase in inequality? And if so, how much? Now, this is a topic on which there are some very strong opinions. There have been some analysis, and we, our intent here is to build on that analysis, to think through to the extent to which it's true, if so, it's, if so, how did it work? And if not, why is it that so many people think that uh, inequality did uh, result from the Fed's quantitative easing? We have three uh, papers to present this morning. All of them are already posted on our website. Three different cuts at the issue. Um, and our plan this morning is to have each of the papers presented. We have a discussant, then we'll take some questions uh, for a few minutes after each paper. And then at the end of the morning, we'll end with a panel discussion that includes a few of the presenters, along with my colleague Don Cohn, formerly of the Federal Reserve, and Kevin Warsh, formerly of the Federal Reserve, now at Stanford. Uh, now, it seemed to me as I was reading these papers, uh, some of which are more technical and economic model-based, and some of which are not, that there are two really important things to keep in mind. Uh, the first is, if all that the Federal Reserve did was increase stock prices, then there really wouldn't be much to talk about. Obviously, stocks are more widely held by people at the top than people in the middle and the bottom, and if stock prices go up, they benefit more. But as Josh Bivens uh, points out in the paper he'll deliver in a moment, uh, house prices are a pretty important factor in all this, and for and for the middle class, house prices are a large part of their assets. So to the extent that house prices go up, it kind of muddies the story a little bit of just looking at what happened to stock prices. But the other thing that's important to keep in mind uh, is one that economists do very well and few other people do, which is to keep in mind the counterfactual. What would have happened had the Fed not done quantitative easing? The compared to what question, which is by its nature hypothetical, uh, is really important because you can't assume that something would have happened or at least have to examine the alternatives. And that's one of the things we'll try and do here this morning. Um, before I introduce Josh, I just want to point out uh, that uh, Ben Bernanke isn't with us today. He's traveling in Asia, but he's interested in the issue and weighed in on his blog uh, this morning. And uh, no surprise, bottom line, he rejects the view that the Fed's monetary policies have hurt the poor and middle class at the expense uh, and, and relative to the rich. And you can see that on his blog. Uh, we're joined this morning by uh, web ca ca cameras from Brookings and C-SPAN, so this is live, so don't say anything you don't want the rest of the world to hear. Uh, and I'm gonna start by introducing Josh Bivens, who's uh, chief economist at the Economic Policy Institute in Washington. He's gonna look at the channels through which monetary policy works and discuss the distributional consequences of each and then do that important compared to what question what would have happened had the Fed not have done quantitative easing, and how do you, what would be the distributional consequences of that? After he presents, uh, Susan Lund of the McKinsey Global Institute, which has done interesting work on this subject, will respond, and then the two of them will join me up here for a little discussion. We'll take your questions before we go to the next paper, which I'll describe when that time comes. So, Josh? Good morning. Um, first of all, thank you to the Hutchins Center for the invitation to participate in this conference, uh, particularly David Wessel and Louise Shiner, who talked to me about the paper and undoubtedly made it a lot better than it would have been otherwise. Um, I'm the research and policy director at the Economic Policy Institute, and just if you don't know, I think it's pretty fair to say that EPI has been for years as exercised as anybody about the rise in inequality that has characterized the U.S. economy over the past generation. Um, and besides being exercised about it, we also think the rise in inequality has pretty strong roots in intentional policy decisions. So when I was asked if I wanted to write something on the intersection between monetary policy and inequality, I, I was definitely intrigued. 
Um, my priors going in were definitely that successful macroeconomic stabilization policy is, is strongly progressive, not just useful and important to do, but, but progressive, provides bigger benefits to the low and moderate um, income households. So I entered with the thought that the expansionary monetary policy during the Great Recession, should that really be different? Well, we know the monetary policy since the Great Recession began has been very different in how it's implemented and the tools that are used, so this was definitely worth looking into. Um, and if my look adds anything to this debate, and who knows, it might not, it's basically what um, David talked about in his introduction. You really want to specify some baseline against which you were judging the effect of expansionary monetary policy and the asset purchases in general um, over the past six or seven years. And so the two baselines I'm talking about, the first one, I'm going to say I'm going to compare it to a fiscal policy stimulus that yielded just equivalent impacts on economic output. Um, and so that's one. And what, what would be the distributional consequences of switching from one to the other? The second baseline is going to be um, no change in other forms of macroeconomic stimulus at all. Just so just if the Fed had decided not to do the asset purchases beginning in 2009, um, just nothing else happened. Um, and what would be the, the consequence of that? <clears throat> the first baseline, uh, fiscal policy stimulus that yields an equivalent boost to economic activity, it's probably of more interest to, to academics. And this is a, a blogger, Nick Rowe. He writes at a place called Worthwhile Canadian Initiative. Um, <laughs> really keen observer of monetary policy and the transmission mechanism, worth reading. And he, he frames the question like this, and basically his, his, what he thinks the right question is, if we use fiscal policy instead of monetary policy to remove a shortage of aggregate demand, would that switch from one to another have distributional consequences? And so that's basically what I'm going to look at. There's a couple problems right out of the gate, though. I mean, there's no such thing as a generic fiscal stimulus. You can do lots of different things to provide a fiscal boost to the economy. Um, just think about tax cuts, just one kind of possible fiscal stimulus. The distributional implications can be really different. We had the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts, which, you know, they were justified some on supply-side long-run growth grounds, but in real time, they were also justified a lot on sort of Keynesian aggregate demand management grounds. Those were not particularly progressive. The 2008 tax cut that was part of the Economic Stimulus Act, also signed by President George W. Bush, much more progressive. So just you know, within tax cuts, it's really hard to characterize the, the distributional implications. Um, transfers, the way transfers are the nature of them in the US economy, they tend to focus most of their benefits on the bottom, say, two-fifths of the income distribution. So increases in transfers as a way of doing fiscal stimulus are going to be pretty strongly progressive. Um, and then a really important issue concerns the, the benefits of um, direct government spending and investment increases, um, both in theoretical models and in the empirical research about the fiscal policy that is effective when the economy is stuck at the zero lower bound of interest rates. Government spending, direct government spending comes in really strong, and so we really probably want to know what the distributional implications of that spending is. Um, the Congressional Budget Office suggests allocating it in two ways. You can either sort of allocate the direct spending on a, on a per capita basis, kind of a, think of it as a lump sum spread across the entire population, or you can allocate it proportional to the, the existing distribution of income. Those yield two really different results, right? I mean, the second one is kind of by definition neutral if you're just going to allocate it proportionally to income. <clears throat> The first way is, is pretty progressive, if it really is sort of a lump sum spending on a per capita basis. Um, and then, of course, it's probably very different depending on what kind of spending we're talking about. The, the distributional implications of defense spending are probably really different than grants to provide bus service in urban areas or school construction in poorer school districts. So the, the, the punchline of all this is it's really hard to think of a generic fiscal policy against which to judge what the Federal Reserve has done since the Great Recession began. And so I decided to try to find a particular um, fiscal policy intervention that is about equal to the estimated impact of the LSAPs over the past six or seven years on economic activity. And it turns out there's a decent one. It's basically the stimulus provisions that were part of the 2010 fiscal deal that sort of pushed back when the, the Bush tax cuts on the top 2% would, would be rolled back. Um, and you can see, I would just sort of look at the um, two columns on the right, the GDP effect and the unemployment effect. Basically, the, the stimulus portions of the 2010 fiscal deal, which were basically a 2% payroll tax cut on the employee side, expanded unemployment insurance, um, and uh, uh, extension of the refundable tax credits that were part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, they basically have almost the same effect, estimated effect on GDP as the um, impact of the LSAPs. And obviously, the estimated impact of the, the asset purchases 
there's a lot of variation there. It's not really tightly estimated. So this is, this is rough orders of magnitude. You know, the first question might be, why don't you compare it to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act? That's the most high profile case of fiscal policy stimulus over the past couple of years. And the answer is that the estimated impacts of ARA were, were really quite large, quite a bit larger than the estimated impacts of the asset purchases. <clears throat> And I'm not really willing to say that the impact of the asset purchases are linear. You can just sort of scale them up and say, ah, let's say we've done two of those. That would equal ARA. I, I don't think it probably works like that. Um, and then also you might ask, why don't I include the actual pushing back of the high-end Bush tax cuts as stimulus in the 2010 fiscal deal? Because um, they're really, really small, their stimulus impact. I mean, the full range of tax cuts, if they had expired in um, 2010, might have been big, but that was never going to happen. Every single politician in town wanted to preserve everything except that was affecting the 2% and below. Um, so this is sort of the specific fiscal intervention that I'm going to compare to, to the LSAPs. And just the, the distribution of the 2010 fiscal deal, you can use basically the Congressional Budget Office data on household income to sort of get a sense of where that money went. Um, <clears throat> and so that first column, the payroll tax cut, that tells you the share of total payroll taxes paid by different income groupings. So the bottom fifth of the income distribution um, pays about 5.6% of all payroll taxes. Um, the sort of 96 to 99th percent um, pays 11% of all payroll taxes. And then you can compare that to the column all the way at the left. It, that's the overall income. That's their share in overall income. <clears throat> um, so a payroll tax cut is, is mildly progressive. Um, the EUC extension, the unemployment insurance extension, the way that column is measuring the share of all non-social security cash transfers that go to different parts of the income distribution. And so I'm going to say that that's a pretty good proxy probably for where the unemployment insurance extensions went. I um, mean, you can see those are quite strongly progressive, definitely concentrated in the middle, say, three-fifths of the income distribution. <clears throat> and then the refundable tax credits that were part of the deal, they're really strongly important for the, for the bottom two-fifths. And basically, I just allocated... <clears throat> And those, those are the, the portions of the income distribution that actually have negative federal income tax rates in the CBO data. And so that's where I'm, I'm allocating those. And so the, the combined impact of the sort of the fiscal provisions of the 2010 fiscal deal, they're pretty progressive, um, particularly the refundable credits and the EUC extension, the payroll tax a, a little less. Um, and so now we can get to... What did, what did the large-scale asset purchases do to inequality? And the, the concern is that LSAPs are going to boost asset prices and that income generated by asset holding is really concentrated at the top. And, and that second point, that it's really concentrated at the top, is, is true. I mean, this is just a measure of um, share of total capital incomes claimed by various income percentiles. And you can see the top 1% is that blue wedge at the bottom. And so in 1979, the top 1% of households claimed about 38% of income generated by asset holding. By 2007, they were claiming 57% of income generated by assets. Um, the bottom 90% has seen their share shrink. Um, and so this, this is the root of the concern. Um, but I actually, when I sort of digging into this and looking at sort of attempts to measure the actual impact of the LSAPs, um, I think that the, the distributional effects of those asset purchases are, are smaller than are often characterized in the popular press. Like some people have even called them, you know, the Fed doing a reverse Robin Hood. That, that strikes me as pretty strong. And I think there's three reasons why these effects are probably smaller than advertised. You know, timing, um, the fact that they're not that different from conventional monetary policy stimulus, except maybe a little less effective. Um, and then the, the impact of housing, as David talked about before. On the timing issue, um, basically, the asset purchases are going to boost prices now, but at some point in the future, they will probably, almost surely, be unwound. And so that's going to put downward pressure on prices. If you held like a, a index fund of the stock market and you just held it over a long period of time, you would see your fund go up and then come down in terms of the marginal impact of, of LSAPs on that. Um, you know, stocks are always incredibly concentrated. So basically, when you push up stock prices, you're helping today's stock owners, maybe at the expense of tomorrow's. But tomorrow's stock owners are not poor people, and they're not even middle class people. They're pretty rich people as well. Um, on the second point, um, it's really not that different what the LSATs are doing than conventional monetary stimulus. I mean, conventional monetary policy pulls down short-term interest rates. And then you hope through arbitrage that the long-term rates that matter for consumption and investment decisions sort of fall in, in sympathy. Um, and that, that's how it's supposed to work. LSAPs sort of go past that intermediate link because the short-term rates are already buried at zero and try to push down long-term rates directly. Um, 
but the, the goal of both is to push down those long-term rates, and those long-term rates cannot go down if you're not pushing up asset prices at the same time. So it, it's really not that radically different a thing than conventional monetary policy. And in fact, some of the, the estimates in this say the impact of a given decline in long-term rates as a result of the LSAPs um, is actually less on stock prices than conventional monetary policy. And I think that's, that's an interesting thing to examine, but th that was replicated in a couple different studies. I mean, part of it may just be when you're measuring the effect of monetary policy at the zero lower bound, you're by definition measuring its impact in a pretty fragile and weak economy, um, but, but it's interesting to think about. And then the last one that, that's pretty important is, you know, housing is an asset price. And I'm sorry, housing is an asset, and its price can be affected by um, the LSAPs. And it's an asset that is held, um, that's very important in the portfolio of the middle class. And so that thing I've highlighted right there, that's sort of the broad middle class. It's the middle 60% of the wealth distribution. And we can see that housing accounts for about 63% of the, their total wealth holdings. So if the impact on home prices stemming from the LSAPs is comparable at all to the estimated impact on stock prices, then you're really going to see you know, a, a pretty neutral effect here. And in fact, what I found is most of the estimates or the implied estimates of the effect of LSAPs on housing prices are, are probably greater than its impact on stock prices. What I found on stock prices, sort of doing a broad scan of the literature, is maybe 5 to 10 percent increase in equity prices stemming from the LSAPs. And so sort of the broad distribution of housing wealth is another thing that makes these, these impacts smaller than you might think. Um, and then I think the really important thing. Um, that's sort of you know fiscal versus monetary, but then we have to think about the real world. And is it really true that if the Fed had decided to not do as much in the way of asset purchases, that fiscal policymakers would have said, "Well, of course we shall jump into the gap and you know fill that hole in aggregate demand." And this is what has actually happened to government spending um, over this uh, recession and recovery. And that line on the bottom, the 2009, is is what's happened um, since the. Um, basically since the trough of the Great Recession. And you can see the red line, it slopes steeply up before the, before the um, trough. And that, that's basically the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, that we actually did do some real fiscal stimulus to fight the recession. Starting at some point in about 2000, late 2010, early 2011, though, um, fiscal policy has been an outright drag on growth. And that's really historically kind of astonishing. If you look at the um, trajectory of government spending, real government spending in this recovery versus all others, fiscal policy has been a very large drag on growth. And so if it is true that output stabilization um, is progressive at all, then this baseline becomes really important. And if it's true that the LSATs actually managed to keep unemployment lower than it would have been, then it's going to have really strongly progressive effects. Um, and we find that low unemployment and that sort of macroeconomic stabilization, it really is progressive. Um, and these are coefficients on a Phillips wage regression, which is basically the change in nominal wages on the left-hand side, lag consumer prices, lag productivity growth, um, some time period dummies, and then the unemployment rate on the right-hand side. And you can basically see that um, and we've got wages at the 10th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 95th percentile. We've done them separately for men and women. And you can see that the wages of the 10th percentile and the 50th are, are much more sensitive to changes in the unemployment rate. The 95th percentile male wage, that, that's not statistically significant. That's why it's transparent. Um, that's what the magnitude is, but it's not statistically significant. Um, and so there is a strong equalizing effect of just output stabilization and low unemployment rates. Um, and so that has to you know, factor really largely. If you think the LSAPs helped stabilize the economy at all, this channel says that they were quite progressive. And just to end, um, what this says is that since the Great Recession, as the Fed has been pursuing expansionary monetary policy, I think it's pretty clear um, that that's been a progressive intervention. Um, I think when we're trying to choose between fiscal and monetary policy, I would have greatly preferred that fiscal policy carried a much heavier load in stabilization, but not necessarily because of its distributional implications. I just think the research says it's much more reliable and effective at the zero lower bound. The distributional outcomes are, are sort of second order. And I think we should, this um, fact that lower unemployment rates you know, have really strong distributional consequences, it does mean we can look at sort of the history of Federal Reserve actions and what is going to happen over the next couple of years. That should affect us strongly. What this says to me is if we go into contractionary monetary policy too soon in the coming years, that actually will have some regressive implications. Um, but what has happened over the past six or seven years, I think the Fed policy has been pretty strongly progressive. And I am out of time. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, David, for inviting me today. Uh, good to see all of you here. First, I want to congratulate Josh on what is a very accessible and interesting paper on the impact of quantitative easing and LSAPs in particular on inequality. Um, he takes us through a lot of the theory and the empirical evidence uh, in a very accessible way and prevent, presents two very interesting counterfactuals, which is what would have happened if we had fiscal policy um, and what would have happened had the Fed done nothing. Um, so overall, I find his arguments and argumentation in the paper very interesting, helpful for anyone to read. So I would congratulate Josh. Um, I want to expand on his overall uh, contention that in fact, um, quantitative easing and the unconventional monetary policies of the last several years have not noticeably or significantly worsened inequality in terms of either wealth inequality or income inequality. Like Josh, I want to begin with the strong caveat that no one's disputing the fact that we've seen increases in both income and wealth inequality in the United States and in other countries, not only since 2007, but predating that as a long-term trend. And it's a concerning trend to an economist in terms of aggregate consumption, particularly for an economy like the United States, where 70% of GDP growth comes from consumer spending. And so the stagnant wages and incomes of a large segment of the population is indeed a concern. Uh, that said, there, I would agree very much with Josh, though, that there's very little evidence that the Federal Reserve's monetary policies have contributed significantly to this. There's been, and I'll walk through three reasons why this is so. First, there's been most of the attention has been paid to the impact of low interest rates and QE on asset prices. Um, we did some work in a report a year and a half ago looking at this question and found, in fact, for equity prices, uh, there's very little evidence that ultra-low interest rates have been responsible for the run-up in the U.S. stock market. First point is that many people tend to forget, although I'm not one of them looking at my personal uh, financial statements, that at the end of 2008, U.S. equities lost 35% of their value. Uh, global equ equities lost 37%. So the increases we've seen in, in the stock market, first of all, let's just put it in context, we're climbing out of a very deep hole. Secondly, you need to look at the theory of through what mechanism should low interest rates boost equity prices. Well, the most direct uh, mechanism would be through a dividend pricing model. So we discount future cash flows, and the lower the interest rate, the lower the discount rate, and so that should boost any valuation of the net present value of future corporate income streams. So you think, all right, there's a very direct mechanism. However, both empirically and theoretically, there are some problems with this argumentation. Uh, first is that if you're a rational expectations investor, you should realize that quantitative easing and ultra-low interest rates are a temporary policy. And so you should not be valuing corporate prospects 10 years out based on whatever the current um, short-term or long-term rates are today. Secondly, uh, sophisticated investors should be using an overall cost of equity, which includes not only the risk-free rate, which would be the interest rate, but also an equity market premium. Um, and we've done modeling at McKinsey estimating what is the um, cost of equity, and we find that it is actually a very stable figure over many decades, ranging between 7 and 8% for U.S. equities, for instance. And this holds true since the recession. So even if investors believe the risk-free rate has gone down, they're apparently um, increasing the equity market risk premium likely with the expectation that, in fact, that, that rates will increase. So theoretically, there's no real evidence there. The other argumentation is that, well, there's a substitution effect. You can't earn anything in bond funds, and so we switch to equity funds. When you look at actual investor behavior, uh, again, there's very little evidence that either retail investors or certainly not professional money managers and institutional investors, in fact, see equities as an alternative asset class to bond fixed income funds. So overall, we conclude that um, equity that QE has boosted U.S. equity prices by maybe 5% at most compared to where they would have been. So. Then the question is, well, why have they increased? Uh, well, corporate profits are at all time historic highs. Uh, companies are sitting on over a trillion dollars of cash. Uh, so there are good fundamental reasons to believe that equity prices have gone up. When you look at a one year forward looking price earnings ratio, you see that US equities today are valued only very slightly over what a long term average would have put them at. 
So to the extent that the wealthy do hold equities, it's true, uh, they may have gotten some slight boost to the value of their wealth holding. Uh, the more important impact of ultra-low interest rates has been on housing prices. And there it's a much more direct channel because uh, people buy housing with mortgages and so as the cost of mortgages goes down, it should have supported housing prices, which again, let's be clear, they have fallen dramatically, fell 30% or more across the US on average. Uh, but the evidence is that they would have fallen even more and been even slower to recover without low interest rates. Um, it's a more direct effect in economies where mortgages are variable rate, like the United Kingdom. The Bank of England has um, said that low interest rates may have supported UK housing prices by 15 to 20%. And the US is a somewhat um, less direct effect because most people have a fixed rate mortgage. So you needed a good credit score to be able to refinance to actually take advantage of these low interest rates. Uh, but as Josh's paper points out, to the extent we believe that housing prices have been supported, that would affect the broad middle class and not the wealthy, where for the top 10% of the income distribution, housing represents only 10% of their wealth portfolio, compared to the broad middle class where it is the main financial asset. Now the more direct um, impact of quantitative easing on household financial well-being that we look at in our report is on interest earnings and interest payments. So here it's a very direct effect, and we don't even need to go to theory. So on one hand, anyone with debt has a lower debt service ratio. And for US households overall, you see that today's debt service ratio, which includes the cost of interest payments as well as principal payments, uh, is now at a level last seen in the early 1990s, 20 years ago. This reflects both a reduction in mortgage debt through the process of deleveraging, but also the very low interest rate. So that's been a huge help for households with debt. Now offsetting that, of course, is anyone with deposits in banks and certificates of deposits or in fixed income funds has seen very low returns on those types of savings. Um, so we look at a figure called that we call the net interest earnings of American households, uh, which nets out the lower debt service payments from the lower income earned on cash deposits and fixed income. And what you see is that there is a clear effect across the age distribution. So basically households headed by people um, under age 54 have benefited because they tend to have more debt and it's almost a linear effect. So households under age 35 on average uh, have benefited by $1,500 per year. It's almost 3% of their disposable income. Um, the group 35 to 44 is benefiting by about $1,700 per annum, 2% of their income. Then when you go to the other end of the age spectrum, households over 75 who tend not to have debt uh, are losing $2,700 per year. Uh, through lower interest earnings. Um, households between 65 and 75 are losing $1,900 per year, about 2% of their income. So there has been a generational impact for sure. Uh, again, overall though, hard to see how this worsens inequality. Um, so I want to end with an open-ended question meant to spark discussion. Um, in the research we did, we looked at the impact of ultra-low interest rates compared to what they had been. But in my mind, there's a very important question, to what extent are ultra-low interest rates even the product of monetary policy? Uh, when you look back over history, since the early 80s, you've seen both nominal and real interest rates fall quite dramatically. Uh, when you look across advanced economies, the, um, the real uh, ex post rate on 10-year government bonds averaged 8% in 1985. It's down to less than 1% today. The nominal uh, rate on 10-year bonds fell from 14% in 1985 to 2% on average today. Uh, so what explains this? Well, as an economist, uh, we learned that interest rates are the product of the supply and demand for funds. Um, and Ben Bernanke, who's not with us, pointed out long before the recession that on one hand, we have the rise of surplus savings in many economies of the world, uh, running large export surpluses and also commodity exporters. But at the same time, we've seen a real dearth of demand. So when you look at the gross investment rate um, of the US and other advanced economies since the early 80s, you see this secular decline in the amount invested in physical capital. Now, part of this reflects a shift to a knowledge economy and intangible capital. Part of it reflects the fact that capital goods cost less. They've had 
tremendous economies of scale and their cost has come down. But overall, we're living in a world uh, in which companies don't see investment opportunities. Uh, you read about share buybacks every other day in the press. Um, many companies have now decided to start to return some of that cash to shareholders simply because they don't see where productive investment is coming from. And so if we are living in a world of secular stagnation and one in which there are too few productive investment opportunities, then I think there's a real question about even with um, large scale asset purchases have ended on net, when we're gonna see interest rates rise. And the phenomenon of very low interest rates may well persist um, you know, for years to come and maybe outside of the control of the Federal Reserve or other central banks. And I'm out of time. So what happens when you don't read the directions? Uh, well, thank you both uh, for uh, both clear and succinct statements. I, I just going to start. At, we're going to. Uh, I'm going to keep this session short of the questions so we can get to the uh, get to the rest of the papers. But uh, Josh, let me ask you. So there are two things that um, just intuitively in my gut I wonder about. And one is, it seems to me there's a bit of a tension here. On one hand, you say all this monetary policy did a great job at restoring, uh, getting us closer to full employment. So that's a plus. And then you say, but it didn't really have much impact on the stock market, so it doesn't have as bad effects on distribution as some people think. Well, aren't those two ideas at, at odds with each other? If the, long, if the quantitative easing packs such a big punch that we think it helped get the economy stronger, how can we say it had such a small effect on stock prices? Yeah. So I wouldn't say it packed that big a punch. I mean, I, I guess maybe, I, I definitely think the, the direction of the LSAPs on economic activity and unemployment were, were in the right direction. It boosted economic activity, it lowered unemployment. I don't know that it was an enormous punch. Like the, the slide I had up there, I think it said basically a 2% of GDP peak effect, um, which happened sometime in, in the past year or so. Um, I guess my, and, and so that, that to me is consistent without enormous impacts on, on the stock market. I guess my, my bigger point is that any positive impact in lowering unemployment has such strong progressive distributional consequences that even if the, the Fed's actions didn't have enormous impacts on unemployment, any impact on unemployment is so strongly progressive that um, that channel works really well if you're concerned about equity. And Susan, uh, can you talk a little bit about the impact of very low interest rates and government bond purchases on governments? You wrote about this in the McKinsey report. And I think that goes to the really hard to answer counterfactual, which is, so did governments benefit from this? And shouldn't, have that, made, shouldn't that have made it easier for do more, to do more aggressive fiscal policy, um, even though they didn't? Yes, uh, thank you for remembering. One of our conclusions was governments are very clear, direct, Beneficiaries, when you look at the net interest payment, um, it's been much cheaper for governments to borrow. That's particularly true for the United States, where at the start of the recession, the average maturity on government bonds was in the neighborhood of four, four and a half years, and they've now extended maturities a bit. But it is a direct savings to governments who can raise money more cheaply than they had. Um, I would never suggest that the Federal Reserve made uh, monetary policy decisions with that as even a remote consideration. But it, it did enable uh, the US government to have a healthier fiscal picture than it would have otherwise. And we can debate whether that should have been used on more aggressive fiscal uh, stimulus early in the recession, or even now. Do you, uh, do you agree with Josh's view that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, so Josh made the point that there was no reason that the Federal Reserve could have expected, had it done less, that Congress would have done more. Do you agree with that? It's a political question. Um, I'm, I'll say I'm not a political scientist. Um, but I am an economist. And empirically, we need only look back at the last seven years to see that you know there has been gridlock in Washington. You don't need to be an economist to see that. <laughs> uh, uh, um, I think we can take a couple questions. Brendan has a mic, if, if there are any. Uh, Andy Levin over here. No, no, don't, don't, wait for the mic. We don't want to miss anything, Andy. 
I really like your paper, Josh. It's a really important question. I just checked on kind of uh, a couple of websites. You know, the median real household income has dropped very substantially still since 2008. So, I mean, that to me, it's, it's hard to believe that that's all, that's all kind of part of a structural trend. And so what you said at the beginning that, you know, there are problems with intentional policy design, I think is the right answer here. Um, and as you know, unemployment isn't the full measure of what's been happening in the labor market. So we think we should also be cautious about um, not exaggerating how much improvement there's been. Um, so two points. First, um, you mentioned about, well, the, the stock market goes up, but then later when they kind of withdraw the LSAPs, it's come down. Uh, I, I'm not completely satisfied with that argument, partly because I think that, as Susan said, the stock market dropped a lot in the aftermath of the recession. And so part of the recovery that we see is, is a recovery back to something more closer to a normal level. So it's not necessarily the case that ending the LSAPs or withdrawing, normalizing the balance sheet is gonna actually cause a fall in the stock market. What we could think of is this was a policy that brought the stock market back up closer to its normal level quickly. And that was a policy decision. We could have made policy decisions to try to bring employment back quickly to its normal level. And that didn't really happen. Okay, the other point is that uh, what you're comparing to fiscal alternatives, and, and for the reasons we've talked about, including the gridlock, I don't think that's the right comparison. So let me suggest two alternatives. One of them is forward guidance. That's the other tool that the FMC has used and other central banks have used. It's an important tool. Mike Kiley has some very nice empirical work examining the differences between forward guidance and LSAPs, their important differences and how they work. I think there's a strong argument that, and maybe Don can weigh in <laughs> at some point, maybe over lunch, about the extent to which the Fed didn't really use forward guidance aggressively at all until around 2013, right? From 2009, 2010, 2011, you know, it was um, kind of this extended period language which basically said we're only a, a few months or nine months away from liftoff. And so in the same way that you're critical of fiscal policy, I think you could ask questions about, well, what, what would be a counterfactual where the Fed would have introduced much more aggressive forward guidance? And then look at the distributional issues there. The other... Can I just... Oh. Do, do you, I just want to ask, so do you think there's a different, a distributional difference between forward guidance and asset purchase? That's what Mike Kiley's results suggest. And it has to do with the effects on the term premium versus the expected future short rates. So we, we could talk about that during a coffee break or something. Okay, but the other alternative, which was not considered in the United States, but has been considered elsewhere, is to have more directed credit programs to try to provide credit to entrepreneurs, you know, and um, small businesses. And there are critical distributional issues here of the extent to which the easy monetary policy helps large corporations reduce their debt obligations and really has not helped we know this, right? The business startup rate has really not improved since 2008. So again, this would be something you could compare as a clean comparison, given it has to be mate policy that we're not gonna count on the fiscal authorities jumping in. There's a couple other possibilities that, that could be considered and what are the lessons for the future? Yeah, so to be clear, my, it is in no way my contention that monetary policy sort of satisfactorily filled the shortfall in aggregate demand since the Great Recession. Um, to me, the, the most reliable way we could have done that was with really aggressive fiscal policy, and we absolutely did not do that, and that's why I'm so critical of fiscal policymakers. To the degree that someone fumbled the ball in a mammoth way, to me, it's them. Uh, and to go back to your earlier question about how can we be sure that they wouldn't have somehow acted better if the Fed had not been so aggressive in the, you know, to my mind, that the Fed chairs communicated really strongly every time they spoke to Congress that fiscal policy is a drag on recovery. I think that, that's the phrase, they, and yet still there was no re response from Congress. Um, in terms of other counterfactuals and sort of other ways to do monetary policy that, that could have been better than what we did or amplified its reach, I totally agree with that. I mean, the recent paper by Simon Wren Lewis and Mark Blythe about maybe trying to figure out a way to give the Fed um, the ability to actually, you know, provide $500 to everybody's checking account, you know, maybe postal bank, and it's, they can't do it now. 
for sure, but that would be a great thing for, for future recessions to think about. And then I would also add housing policy is a big part of this. I think we did miss a key transmission mechanism of lower interest rates because so many people who could have been able to refinance couldn't because their loan to value ratios were, were too high. And if we could have done some program to allow those people into the refinancing channel, that could have helped a lot. So we'll get to this, that in a second. Yeah, point. this is not to say you know the Fed did absolutely everything right. I think it's just to say that, that what they did do pushed in the right direction, even from sort of a distributional angle. I, I would make two points. I think that the, that the academic literature on forward guidance and its effectiveness is, is a little bit more subject to debate than you would suggest. Um, at the end of the day, I think we all believe that should economic conditions change suddenly for the, for the better or for the worse, uh, the Federal Reserve and in any other central bank in the w world would act very quickly, no matter what they said previously. Uh, but the second point on funding for small businesses, uh, Europe has been the most aggressive with directed lending um, towards SMEs and trying to promote SME securitization to get credit going to small businesses. Um, and I know this only because we're doing new research on this. Um, but the results are quite astonishing. Um, so if you take the EU as a whole and the US, they're roughly the same size economies in terms of GDP. US SMEs outstanding, um, according to a study done out of London, have $3 trillion of outstanding credit, and the European ones, $1 trillion. So despite the attempt to get credit flowing to SMEs in Europe, uh, that has not been a successful policy. So um, whatever the Fed has done right or not done right, um, funding for small businesses in the US is dramatically well, But I think better. what Andy's saying is, I mean, any time you want to make, feel good about what happened in the United States, you just use Europe as a benchmark, right? Um, good so point. the question good is, point. what could what could we have done that would have made the outcomes different? Why don't we take one more question? And we'll get more to this. Uh, uh, Bob Samuelson over there, and then we'll we'll move to the second paper. We'll come back to these issues as the day goes on. Bob Samuelson. Thanks, uh, Bob. Oops. Bob Samuelson, Washington Post. Um, Last week, Byron Wien, who is a well-known stock strategist, uh, now works for Blackstone, put out a commentary in which he um, recounted the following arithmetic. Since uh, the low point in 2009, stock uh, market valuation has increased $13 trillion. Of that, he's, he attributes $3 trillion, which is almost a quarter, to the Federal Reserve's uh, QE policies. That's a major part of the increase. By contrast, your appraisals, both of your appraisals, is that the QE had at most a very modest effect on the increase in stock prices. Could you explain why you think, that, and I take Wien's um, arithmetic to be typical of Wall Street, that there's an obsession with what the Fed is doing and has done and will do. Could you uh, try to explain why there is such a large gap between people on, who are in the markets and people who are watching people in the markets and trying to decide what they're doing and okay, why? Okay, so pick, Wall Street or economists, I, right? I definitely go with the economists. Um, <laughs> Stock prices have risen, but they fell 35%, okay? There's one factor. Second factor is, look, in, in our analysis of QE boosting stock prices by no more than 5%, we did not take into this broader-based economic growth effect. So that ha the, if the recession had been dramatically worse and corporate earnings would have therefore been dramatically worse, you know, how bad could it have been? That counterfactual is something we didn't measure. But for the reasons I explained, I think that corporate profitability is up. Low rates have helped companies very slightly through lower debt service payments like they have helped households. Um, you know, but overall, we've, we're living in a world uh, where companies have done very, very well, uh, particularly in the US, and that explains the outperformance. Um, but I, would, I will take a look at those calculations and see where we come out so dramatically different. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at his detailed calculations either. I haven't heard of this, so I, I would like to take a look. I would say I occasionally see sort of traders overestimating, in my view, the impact of sort of Federal Reserve decisions. And my guess it's because they live in such a short-term world. I mean, if you look at some of the empirical research on sort of LSAPs, it's sort of event study um, where they look at, you know, what happened when it's announced. 
And if you, if you stop there, you might get a pretty dramatic effect, but you know, then the price goes up when it's announced and then it sort of decays over time. And so getting the impact of the LSAPs over the entire period of time rather than that day that I remember when they announced it and stock prices jumped through the roof maybe, uh, I feel like that's part of the difference between you know, the, the trader view of the world, which is what happened you know, day to day versus what has happened over sort of the entire time span. But let's say that Byron Wien is right. And let's say that, I mean, after all, People who bet on the stock market tend to make more money at it than people who don't bet on the stock market. Um, so if he was right, and if the effect on stock prices was a lot larger than in, in your, in, as you discussed in the literature, given all the other things, including house prices, would that have made a big difference on a distribution question? Yeah. I mean, that the real horse race is between what it does to stock prices, which are very concentrated at the top, versus what it does to housing prices, which are broadly distributed. You know, if I'm wrong and there's a much larger impact on stock prices, then, then absolutely a lot of my conclusions would need to be modified. Okay, uh, stay here for a minute. We're gonna, I'm just gonna introduce the second panel so we can uh, keep this going. The second paper we have, which follows really right very nicely after this, is by Martin Baraja, Eric Hurst, and Joseph Vavra of the University of Chicago, and Andreas Fuster of the New York Fed. Eric Hurst and Andreas are here with us today. And what they look at is, okay, it's great to say this was good for housing prices, but if you happen to be, have the misfortune of living in a community where all the housing prices were underwater, it wasn't gonna lift your ass, it wasn't, you were gonna have this luxury of, of refinancing and it might not have helped. So their paper looks at inequality, but regionally rather than across classes. So why don't we go sit down and we'll come back.